The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Flora MacDonald never became Prime Minister of Canada, but she was the first woman to take a real run at it. Tonight, as a new book profiles her career, we'll speak to the author and the former Prime Minister who appointed her to be the first woman ever to serve as this country's Minister of Foreign Affairs. First up, Nam Kiwanuka finds out how the Art Gallery of Ontario opened its classrooms to the province during this pandemic, bringing art instruction to places it had never gone before. It's Monday, December 20th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Not a lot has been good about this pandemic, but it has led to some creative thinking about how to do things differently. The Art Gallery of Ontario, for one, saw an opportunity to bring its art education programs to nearly every part of the province. With us to explain, in Coburg, Ontario, Jocelyn Chapman, who teaches a split grade of five and six in the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. And in Ajax, Zavet Quadros Evangelista, Associate Curator for School Programs and Early Learning at the AGO. So hi to you both. Hello. Thanks uh, for having hi. me. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, Zavet, I wanted to turn to you first. How did the AGO manage to, there's, there's only one word that I can use in this situation, <laughs> but how did the AGO manage to pivot once it was shut down during the pandemic? Yeah, when in, uh, in March of, you know, 2020, when the gallery closed um, and we realized that virtual field trips or just field trips in general were not actually going to happen. Uh, the gallery quickly decided to develop some strategies on what this outreach would look like and making art accessible uh, through arts education um, is at the core of uh, the AGO's mission. So what we did was, you know, in a typical year, we would see around 35,000 students who would make their way on site. And because we knew that this wasn't going to happen, um, what we did was kind of thought about what are ways in which we would be able to engage with our audiences, these 35,000 students now, you know, who would not be able to come into the building itself. Um, we had some experience in um, experimenting with virtual programming prior to prior to this um, mass pandemic. In what capacity? Um, and in with our particular partnership with Connected North. Mm -hmm. uh, so with Connected North, we were delivering art instruction uh, to rural communities um, in the North and through a two-way technology that Cisco provided. So we used some of the learnings from that experience and kind of worked to build new content, work to build kind of a new platform in order to be able to deliver a virtual session. And I think with the adaption and the adoption of Zoom kind of by by everyone, it seemed um, like the most simplest way that we were able to share what we were doing in the gallery with everyone. Um, some people, kind of, you know, some some kids might not be able to come to the AGO because it is cost prohibitive, or maybe they don't live mm -hmm. um, near uh, the AGO. Doing it this way online, how many kids are you able to reach? So in the in our last kind of year, when we launched in October all the way through to June, we reached over 755,000 students. Wow. So this included students and parents and teachers and homeschoolers, really the entire gamut of uh, visitors who would come um, come to our building were now joining us on site. And oh, jo joining us online. And Jocelyn, it is your uh, responsibility as a teacher to kind of translate or manage. You know, when my kids were doing the online learning at the beginning, um, all the kids' voices talking at the same time. There's a lot happening, right? Um, so how difficult was it to teach art virtually? Um, I think it was difficult. Uh, it was hard, hard to guide the children. So oftentimes when we're in a classroom together, we can see step by step, we can see what they're doing. So I think that was one of the hardest things. Um, it was also hard because we kind of lost some of our experts. Like when, if we took a field trip to the AGO, we know we can rely on the experts. Um, so having a virtual session, I know that teachers that I spoke to myself for sure, having that chance to just know that you were getting quality education made a huge difference. It made it a lot easier. In what um, ways? To have a voice. 
just knowing that if we were going to pre be presented with a painting, that the history of the painting was going to be accurate, the um, composition, we were going to get an idea of how it was made, when it was made. And it saved, like the teachers were kind of transferring all everything we'd ever done to online. That was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we didn't have to do this research about art, which is very important, um, just kind of made it like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put art at the forefront because somebody's doing the research for me. This is pre-made. I can, I can access this. Zavet, who teaches these classes? So these uh, classes are taught by our uh, art educators in our gallery. We have about um, about 13 art educators, um, and again, they are you know they're professional, they're teachers, they're educators, they're kind of thinkers and Afrofuturists, and they all come together, bringing their passion to what we do with bringing the arts um, and this curriculum to students and teachers. Um, each of our art educators, as well, kind of really thoughtfully uh, thinks through kind of our topics that we've created um, and share these out with our um, with our students. Um, it's been quite a challenge as well for our art educators to be able to um, to be able to deliver kind of a program online when they're so used to being surrounded by students and you know having that moment to scaffold questions and responses but everyone has done such an amazing job kind of embracing this new technology um, and being able to engage in this virtual way through zoom through this platform that's made available so that's kind of something that's really nice and really special um, and we're so uh, we're so proud of our uh, of our amazing team now the logistics of it now we're at home and the kids can access it if they're in their classroom virtually um jocelyn before um would a class trip to the ago have been possible for your students i think uh classes from our school have gone to the ago before but um the classroom i have i'm gonna say it would not have been accessible sometimes the gas money alone to take a bus into the city is prohibitive for prohibit prohibitive for families. Um, so just taking the gas out of the equation made it a lot more accessible. Kids get excited when I have the AGO field, I put it as an AGO field trip on the blackboard on our schedule and they come in and they read the schedule and they're like, oh, it's a field trip day. So it just opens the world up to them some more. Yeah, it's my my daughter's favorite. Uh, every every time they do uh, a, a trip to the AGO, she's so excited about it. We're going to the museum, we're going to the art gallery. Um, and Jocelyn, when I come back to you, what has the virtual art program meant for you and your students? I think it's really invaluable. Uh, our school board, all of Canada, I hope, has a really big focus on reconciliation. And one of the calls to action is through education. Mm -hmm. And the AGO, I believe it's every Tuesday, their art focus is Indigenous Voices. And that's how I got started with the virtual field trips. I thought this is a reliable source. These are own voices. So really, it's been invaluable. It's art. It's um, reconciliation, it's engaging for the students. They do um, like a program and then they offer a mini art activity at the end. So the kids get to react to the artwork too, which is half of the art curriculum. So it's very important, very valuable. Zavet, how does this program work? Oh, I'm so excited to explain this, and it's exactly as uh, Jocelyn kind of mentioned. So we have 30-minute sessions um, where an art educator will deliver a program. So they'll select two works of art from the collection. Uh, and within 30 minutes, we go through the critical analysis process as outlined in the curriculum. But we're really trying to make this fun for students who are joining us. Um, so there's a little bit of art exploration, um, a little mini art-making activity. And because wellness has been such a huge component uh, for us in this past year and particularly for our students as well we include a wellness moment just a minute to pause and to think about where you are what it is that you are doing um, and in our sessions as well we invite participants to use with just a pencil and a piece of paper and come in and you know respond to the works of art a really fun moment for us is actually that live component that live engagement where an art educator will ask a question and then in our Q&A section, we'll get all these responses from students from wherever they are uh, across the board. So, you know, if you're in 
deep Scarborough or in, in Etobicoke, or if you're out in Chatham, for example, you're all kind of responding to this collective question that has been asked. And so building the sense of community in this really quick 30 minute moment in a virtual space is really something that's special. It's kind of magical in a sense because you're connecting so many people from so many different parts of the provinces, their different perspectives, experiences, and then they're coming together to, to enjoy uh, something we all really uh, are privileged to experience. Uh, Jocelyn, how has it been received on your end? Well, my students get excited, like I said. It's like, oh, field trip day, we're going on a field trip. They always want to know more about the artist. They love the actual presenters at the AGO. Uh, they, you can just tell the respect right away. So there's 25 kids in the class and they're all listening. I would say one of the favorite parts is that interactive piece. So I have one device and the students will give me answers and then I'll type them in the device. And if the presenter um, says, oh, Mrs. Chapman's class says this, then they'll say it in the presentation. And my kids are just like, yes, we got on, like they think they're kind of famous. We got on the presentation. <laughs> so like, it's just a hundred percent engagement. It's, and it's good quality. Uh, let's take a look at what a virtual session looks like. Sheldon, please roll. So that's what I'm saying. You see that, that even though this kid is in this modern kitchen, they're still connected to their um, Inuit culture in that toy, which is obviously not modern, but traditional, right? So our mini art activity, of course, has to do with food, my favorite dish. So if you decide to create your favorite dish, make sure you hashtag AGO schools uh, Zavet, let's uh, let's talk about what we just saw. Uh, the artwork is by Annie Putukuk, and it's called "Licking the Plate Clean." Uh, can you tell us more about the artist? Yes, of course. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, our art educator, Malaika Wairi, kind of really sets the stage up um, for getting into this conversation with our students about Annie Putaguk. Uh, and at the beginning of her session, she invites uh, participants to actually share uh, where they are from. And that really kind of centers um, the conversation about Annie Putaguk. Um, so Annie Putaguk is an Inuk artist um, and one of the pioneers of a new style of art that actually came in from King and from Kingite Studios. Um, Annie Putuguk hails from an artist, uh, from a family of artists. So there's draftswomen and printmakers and um, and stone carvers, but unlike her predecessors um, who depict hunting scenes and kind of this um, this pristine north. Um, they're depicting their realities. For Annie Putaguk, her drawings represent her everyday life. And so a life where tradition comes up alongside the impacts of modernity um, and mass consumerism. So in this color pencil piece, Malaika is just sharing with the students, you know, there's accoutrements of a kitchen. So whether you are across the province, if you're here in the city, you might recognize these elements of what's in your kitchen. So there's a little cup in the back and a little kettle that's kind of brewing on the side. So again, inviting students that, you know, Annie Putuguk is all the way in King It, but you in your kitchen, what does your space look like? You know, and what does she have on that plate um, that the, the person who's sitting on the floor on the plate, what are they possibly looking? What was so delicious on that plate? And then invite students to think about what would they fill on their plate if, you know, that they would lick, that would be just so delicious. Uh, and Zavette, you know, I, I'm, trying, I've, I'm trying to remember the last time that I had a, a dish so good <laughs> that I was licking the plate, but it's such a nice feeling. Um, the AGO has a lot of amazing art from indigenous artists. Um, when you showcase it, you try to follow our themes. Absolutely. So our sessions every day are actually thematic. Um, so the sessions that Jocelyn tunes into um, this year, they are every Tuesday. We focus on Indigenous art and artists, but we also offer sessions on um, spotlighting uh, BIPOC artists um, in art of Africa and the African diaspora. We have art and the senses. Um, we also have included this year an art making kind of 101 really for teachers and students to come in and have this moment where you're looking at technical um, 
um, aspects of art making through line and color and texture and space. Um, and then we also include our partnership program. So every Thursday, uh, we partner with cultural institutions. Um, last year, we partnered with um, the National Ballet of Canada and the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, and then cultural institutions in Hong Kong um, and the U.S. as well. So really to have this holistic view of what art is and the possibilities um, of art through cross-curricular connections. Well, we're going to look at some art now. Um, Jocelyn, you and Zavette shared the art from your class after this Zoom class. Um, tell us about these drawings and what happens on your end, Jocelyn. <laughs> Um, so this, oh, I just love this picture because uh, this was after the licking the plate clean. So it, I love that all the kids need is a piece of paper and a pencil. So again, just the accessibility piece. Um, and then they were invited to draw their favorite dish, a dish that would make them lick the plate. So we had a big conversation about this one because that is steak and tacos. So just like the glory <laughs> it's of balanced. the meal. Absolutely. Um, there is a little motivation piece too, because I'm always like, oh, if we get these done, if you want me to um, tweet them, I can tweet them out to the AGO. And if the AGO ever responds, then I read that to the class. So it's not something that they create and then it just sits there or it gets shoved in their backpack. It kind of they like the idea that it kind of goes to the world a little bit. Mm. Um, I think this one had bacon on it. I'm actually vegan. So anytime the kids can throw in something with bacon, they do. <laughs> they can't believe that. Uh, but who doesn't love bacon? And then another oh, one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So uh, this child interpreted it a little different, the art activity, and this is his version of licking that plate clean. And I just, this, he is a comic drawer, very talented. This one was from um, a different session. It was a machine one. So this was art and the senses, and this was a creation. We got to create a machine. Mm -hmm. And the activity for this one was to kind of do the, the movement and the feeling of a machine so that the kids enjoyed that one. It was a little bit more abstract. So we had a discussion about what abstract is versus kind of realism. And it was, it, they're rich activities. Sometimes we take five minutes, sometimes we take 20, 25, whatever the kids want to do with it. I love the shading of that. Um, <laughs> Zavet, uh, Jocelyn mentioned that the art is uh, showcased um, and shared. How important is that for children when they are learning how to be creative? It is absolutely important. And I think, you know, even at the beginning of sessions, we really do try to um, make sure that we call out students. So particularly if schools kind of pop their names in their classrooms, it's so nice to actually hear from Jocelyn and teachers. You know, they'll send us a note saying, thank you for calling my classroom out and for my school out. Because even though in sessions, you know, there could be thousands of students uh, tuning into one session, just being able to acknowledge that folks have actually taking the time out of their day to come in, sit down, tune in is is so important. Um, we collect all of our artworks and so we put the hashtag AGO schools and at the end of every session we're able just to see the plethora of responses that come in from sessions that happen throughout the week. Uh, and it's a nice reminder of of what it is we're doing and the impact that it has on um, on our communities and on our schools and teachers and parents and caregivers and everyone who kind of tunes in. And Jocelyn, I know some kids can be um, shy in a classroom setting or they might not think they're as great of an artist as the students sitting next to them. But do you find that doing art this way is may maybe uh, allowing some of them to come out of their shells and to become more creative? I think so. I, I actually like the idea that they're called mini art activities. I think that in itself takes some of that daunting. No, that's not a word. I think that I think the fact that they're called mini art activities uh, makes it easier for some kids to engage that don't think they're capable of doing a professional artwork. And then the fact that we're sharing these like it, they're they're their work and it's worth sharing kind of builds their confidence. So I don't have any kids that say, I can't do this. They all want to try. They all want to get on Twitter 
and they they're proud of themselves when they do see what they create it's really nice the the, uh, the process uh focus as well right like it's nice when students like there's no pressure on them to create something that's a product at the end yeah. it's really it's like what are you thinking about like yeah. how are you putting what you were thinking about onto this kind of piece and um it's really nice jocelyn that she i love how the words are misspelled like i love how spaghetti is spelled and how sushi is spelled because it's really you're like yeah this is the gist of you know here's something that you need to do kind of you just put your thoughts down and that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind i know online uh, online school hasn't been the greatest thing invented uh, but do you find that this is maybe a positive side to learning online virtually i think for sure it has been i love that uh, there's a variety of topics to choose from i love that even when we were back in the classroom it was still offered it just is that professional piece, like professionals delivering a program and making it accessible for anybody. It's it's definitely been a silver lining. And do you mark the kids on the art? It depends on most of the time, no. I was just saying like if there, we haven't done, if there was one that focused on something we had been talking about, there's a chance that I might accept, um, I might mark them on it, but most of the time it's the experience it's their connection to the artwork it's listening to the critical analysis that's given of the artwork so mostly it's just an enjoyable experience uh, getting to know art more and zavet uh, what can teachers do if they're interested in bringing their classes in so to speak <laughs> We'll, we'll have our sessions kind of ready to go. We Our last session uh, will end for the winter term, but we will pick up again uh, on January the 11th and go all the way through to the end of June. Um, teachers can visit ago.ca, uh, learn and virtual school programs to see a schedule of programming that's on there. And it's a quick registration link that they can uh, access. And as a curator, um, you know, I use that dreaded word pivot at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> um, as a curator, Curator, what has it meant for you to be able to experience this with kids and to see that um, they can still access this art even though they're not there in person? I think this really is core to what the AGO kind of values in terms of accessibility. So it's really nice to actually hear Jocelyn, you know, share a little bit about her programming and the value that it has to classrooms, um, to her classroom. But also we hear that quite often that part of our community as well, just being able to have quality uh, art education delivered by kind of professional art educators who themselves are, you know, poets and teachers and storytellers and kind of really passionate about the work that they do um, and this is a really nice tie-in to kind of bring it all together and what I've learned is that you know no one is ever tired of like seeing and talking and hearing and sharing art so I think that will kind of continue uh, whether we are on site and whether we continue online um, and are there similar programs or activities families can enjoy together Absolutely. Um, since the start of the pandemic, the AGO has kind of gone full virtual. So all our online talks, uh, youth programs, uh, art courses, online family programs, um, everything you'll find on AGO.ca. And so a lot of the programs will commence um, in January um, of 2022. Um, Jocelyn and Zavet, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us. And also for all the work that you're doing, I, it hasn't been a great uh, time for a lot of people, for all of us, but I think when you're teaching children um, and trying to fill in the gaps, I think it's even been more challenging. So we really do thank you for everything that you've been doing. Uh, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How many people in this world go from being a secretary to the Secretary of State for External Affairs? I'll bet not many, but Flora McDonald did it. Flora was a pioneer in so many ways. She was the first and still only female MP from Kingston and the Islands, the only woman in a 107-member Progressive Conservative Caucus, the first woman to run for the leadership of the federal PC party, the first female foreign minister in Canadian history as well. She also visited Afghanistan numerous times and faced several near-death experiences as she traveled all over the world trying to do good. She died six years ago at age 89. Her life story is told in a new book. It's called Flora, A Woman in a Man's World, 
and it brings author Jeffrey Stevens to our program from Cambridge, Ontario. And Jeff, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? Just fine. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Her father, Flora's father, growing up in Atlanta, Canada, taught her back in the 30s that girls were just as good as boys. And I wonder how unusual a message that would have been for a girl to hear in Sydney, Nova Scotia, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Oh, it was very unusual. Uh, at that time in, in North Sydney, the uh, school ended at, uh, at grade 11. And at that point, uh, uh, boys were expected uh, to, uh, if they had the money, to uh, go on to university uh, or college. Uh, the girls were expected to either uh, uh, become secretaries or nurses or school teachers. Uh, uh, there was no, not a whole lot of money in Cape Breton in those days. In fact, there was very little. Um, and if families did have any money, they, they went to the education of their sons, not their daughters. Uh, and as far as uh, family were told uh, not to worry about her, uh, she'd be married before they knew it. Well, she wasn't, in fact. And she <laughs> went to secretarial school. No, she never did marry. She did go to secretarial school, never went to university, eventually got a job at the national headquarters of the Progressive Conservative Party. What did she do there? Uh, well, she started as a... Uh, as basically a secretary to the national director, uh, who usually wasn't very much around the premises. Uh, but she, over time, uh, basically was running the headquarters. I mean, she was the one that everybody turned to. Uh, they had a series of a succession of the national directors who were uh, largely absentee uh, uh, directors, or if they were around, uh, uh, didn't pay all that much attention to the party organization. And uh, so she... Uh, she effectively was running running the party, uh, headquarters at least. And despite that, she seemed to have a pretty terrible relationship with the conservative leader of the day, John Diefenbaker. How come? Well, I think she liked him uh, at the beginning. In fact, she was very excited uh, uh, when she started because that was just before the 1957 election uh, when the conservatives uh, uh, ousted uh, the liberals after 22 years. And... Uh, and became a minority conservative government. And uh, she was very, she was quite almost delirious uh, about uh, Diefenbaker and uh, excited by him and, uh, and was for the first few years. And then uh, uh, Diefenbaker, I think, became more, or she felt, became more uh, enamored of the power that he had, became more distant and, uh, and more uh, paranoid and, and perhaps dictatorial. And uh, she, turned, uh, she turned away from him uh, uh, and, uh, and became... Um, very concerned about his leadership. In 1972, I guess we should hasten to add, she wasn't the first Macdonald to become the MP for Kingston. That would be Sir John A. Uh, but she was another Macdonald, and she was the only woman... Boy, the cover of your book... Well, we'll get to that picture later. She's the only woman in a 107-member PC caucus. And just four years after that, she finds herself running for the leadership of the party. And here she is at the 1976 Leadership Convention in Ottawa. Sheldon, roll it if you would. I would like to thank His Worship David Crombie, Mayor of Toronto, for having done me the honour of placing my name in nomination. And I'd like to thank him quite surely for telling him to do it. <laughs> That's from a National Film Board documentary by Peter Raymond called Flora, Scenes from a Leadership Convention. What was the, in your view, historic significance of her bid for the leadership that year? Well, it was uh, her, it, she was the first woman uh, to run for the leadership of either of the major political parties. Uh, Rosemary Brown had won for the le run for the leadership of the NDP the year before and had finished second uh, to Ed Broadbent. But uh, Flora was the first for either the Liberals or the Conservatives. And... Uh, it was a. Uh, here she was. Uh, she had been the only woman for some time in the Conservative caucus, and yet she was uh, out there running for the for the leadership. and uh, And she had good support uh, from people in the caucus and uh, and across the country because she was so well known had, through her job at the national headquarters, and she'd been the liaison between the caucus and the the grassroots of the party. Let's go back to Peter Raymond's documentary and find out who actually won that contest, shall we? Sheldon, again, if you would. February 22, 1976. Charles Joseph Clark, 
36-year-old member of parliament from High River, Alberta, defeats 12 other candidates to become the 14th leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. And joining us now, the winner of that convention and the 16th Prime Minister of Canada from the nation's capital, there's Joe Clark. Mr. Clark, it's great to have you on the program there. Do you recognize the guy in that clip? Uh, it, it's a long time ago, different color hair, same tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and Flora MacDonald were, um, I guess, opponents at that 76 convention, but philosophically, you were quite simpatico, actually. How come? We were contestants, uh, and I don't think ever really opponents. I took a long time to consider whether I would run, and I began as a supporter of Flores. And then it became clear to me that uh, there might be some opportunity uh, for me as well, and probably a safeguard. So uh, I entered the uh, entered the race, and um, uh, we appealed to, I think, uh, a, a similar base of supporters in the uh, uh, in the then Progressive Conservative Party. Did you and Flora have an understanding before the first ballot was announced that whoever did better would go to the other candidate eventually? No, no understanding in any formal sense, but I, I think we both expected that that is the way things would uh, would develop. Of course, she figured she'd be ahead of you, right? She did, and uh, for most of the campaign, so did I. <laughs> well, here was the moment when Flora McDonald found out that the strong support that Jeffrey Stevens just talked about, that she expected on that first ballot, well, it actually evaporated. Sheldon, roll it if you would. McDonald, 214, just like a dog. I just thought somehow that, that my windpipe had been cut. I, I wondered if I was still breathing. And about three minutes later, I realized I must still be breathing because I was still alive. Obviously, there was momentary shock. To everyone's surprise, Flora has placed the disappointing sixth. So, Mr. Clark, in real time at that convention on that day, when you heard her number announced, and it was so much lower than she thought it would be, what did you think had happened? I frankly wasn't considering her position. I was more surprised by mine than I was by uh, by hers. Um, and uh, my thoughts then were, what uh, would I do to go on to uh, to win? Um, it was Flora had very strong support both in the party and I think in the caucus. And I think in a sense she was a casualty of her time. She pay a price uh, to be the first, and she was the first in a. Uh, uh, in a time when women were not expected to run for the leadership, let alone the win, win the leadership of parties. Uh, and I think that's important to bear in mind. Jeff, it became known as the Flora Syndrome. Why don't you tell us what that means? Well, the Flora Syndrome uh, was a, uh, it means that uh, a lot of people who had pledged themselves to support a candidate uh, in the end uh, uh, did not. Um, in Flora McDonald's case, roughly 100 people, 100 more people wearing Flora badges walked into the polling booth than Flora votes came out. Uh, somewhere in that transition, uh, 100, uh, roughly 100 delegates' votes were lost. Uh, her people were expecting her to be in the mid 300s, and she came in in the low 200s. Um, her assessment, um, well, let's put it this way the popular assessment at the time, the conventional assessment, was that uh, men simply couldn't vote for a woman uh, to be the leader of the party. Um, Flora's assessment was somewhat different. Uh, she said that she thought the problem was the women. Uh, but women voters uh, felt that uh, they could, they, it was just too radical. They couldn't, it was further than they could go. Um, they didn't, they thought they had to support men. They, 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 had, they had voted conservative uh, as, their, as their husbands wanted for a long time. They were trying to stick with the uh, the way they had come with their husbands, and it just uh, uh, that was her analysis. And I think it's probably right. There, in some of the interviews that were done afterwards, there are a lot of women who sort of liked Flora, wished her well, would have been really happy if she had won, but weren't quite prepared to vote for. It was too early. They weren't ready. Women in particular weren't ready for a woman leader of the party. Hmm. That's a Flora syndrome. Well, that was 1976, and then three years later was actually a very big year in the history of the Conservative Party, Progressive Conservative Party. 
Uh, the party won its first election since 1962. Joe Clark became the prime minister, youngest ever, 39 years old. And John Diefenbaker died. And, Mr. Clark, I want you, if you would, to finish a story that I will start for you, which is in the book. You and Flora are talking at Mr. Diefenbaker's funeral, and there's a bomb scare. And apparently, the officials come up to you and say, you got to make the decision. We either clear the building right now or we go on with it. Do you remember what you said? I certainly do. Uh, I looked around the room uh, to determine who might be uh, uh, planting a bomb. I looked at the uh, Liberal members of Parliament. I looked at the Senate. I looked at all those people who were the likely suspects. And uh, I assumed the only person who might have planted the bomb in a room like that would be John Diefenbaker. He was in no condition to do that. So I decided <laughs> we would take the chance. And the funeral went ahead as scheduled. And the funeral went ahead as scheduled. <laughs> Very good. Now, as the cover of Jeff's book shows, she was the only woman in your cabinet in 1979, and you gave her a big job, a Secretary of State for External Affairs, basically what we call the Foreign Minister today. Why did you give her that job? Because she'd proven herself. Uh, not only had she proven herself as a parliamentarian, as a contestant, but she probably knew more about the world, even at that time, in terms of actually having been there, having understood uh, the dynamics that make other societies work than, than almost anyone else in the caucus. And uh, she had great capacity. She demonstrated that in other portfolios uh, she held. Uh, she was not, uh, she was firm, but not pushy. She got along with male colleagues uh, and with others. Uh, by and large, with some notable exceptions, she got along with the officials in the, in the uh, very accomplished Department of, uh, of External Affairs. But uh, she was the best choice uh, anyone could have made, I think, for foreign minister at that time. Was it ever awkward for her, or frankly for the men, that she was the only woman in that cabinet? I don't think so, because Flora was accustomed, Jeff would have be able to give uh, data on this, but Flora was accustomed to being the only woman uh, in a circumstance, or if not the only one, certainly one of a, of a fairly uh, small number. So I don't think it upset her. And I think that uh, while people were obviously unwilling to vote for her on that first ballot, uh, a lot of the male members of caucus were quite accustomed to working with Flora. So I don't think that her gender was a, a, a significant problem. Uh, there were caricatures at the time, of course, uh, but I don't think they ever uh, got in her way. Jeff, did she ever, when you were working on the book with her, express, um, you know, evidence of sexism that she would have faced in the cabinet or that kind of thing? Not, uh, certainly not in the cabinet that I heard of. Uh, uh, there was some... Uh, 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 curiosity, I would say, about her when uh, she was first elected, and she was the only uh, only woman in, in the caucus. And uh, and later on, uh, she and and one of the women from headquarters uh, did some training uh, of uh, of conservative uh, members of parliament on how to uh, try to attract the women's 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 vote and uh, uh, how to approach women at the door if they're knocking on them and so on. And uh, and uh, you know shake the woman's hand, ask the woman for her opinion, ask her how she's going to vote. Don't assume she's going to vote the way her husband, who's standing next to her, is going to vote, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, then there was a funny scene just at the end of that, and George Hees, uh, one of the old guard in the caucus, stood up and said, uh, Flora, you girls have done a great job. I said, <laughs> girls, girls, what can you do with laugh? It was George Hees. It wasn't, you know. You couldn't take that too seriously, but that was sort of the attitude in the caucus. These, these girls do good things. <laughs> well, her two biggest files on her desk when she was foreign minister were the so-called boat people, the refugees fleeing the chaos of Southeast Asia, and the American hostages being held in Iran. So let's talk about that. Jeff, the hostage crisis. What role did she have in hiding those six Americans in Canadian residences in Tehran, Iran? Well, she got the call from uh, the department uh, uh, to please come to her office quickly on a Friday morning. Um, she was uh, uh, at home in Ottawa, and she went down to the uh, to the department and uh, uh, I guess her parliament her office in the in the center block. and uh, And the officials were gathered there. And they told her that they had had this message from uh, from Tehran that uh, there were at that point five Americans who had uh, come looking for shelter uh, through the auspices of John Sherdown, who was the commercial attaché there. And the number two, I guess, in the in the embassy, 
who was a tennis partner of one of these people. And later, a sixth one came along. There were six of them, and they were sheltered in the Sheardown house and, uh, and in uh, Ken Taylor, the ambassador's home. Uh, and she was given this information, and her, her immediate instinct was that we have to look after them, have to protect them, but I've got to talk to the prime minister. And so she went into the House of Commons. It was a Friday morning. We were seatmates, and she said to Mr. Clark, uh, uh, can I see you for a moment after, uh, stay behind for a moment after the question period. I have something to tell you. And she told uh, Mr. Clark what had happened, and uh, and he agreed very quickly that, uh, yes, they had to. That was a recommendation of the department. That, yes, they had to sh- shelter these people and look after them and do what they could, keep them safe until they could get them out. Mr. Clark, would you rate her performance during the course of all of that? Oh, she the one time she nearly lost her cool, maybe the only time, uh, was during a later question period. I had spoken to the former prime minister, uh, Mr. Trudeau, partly to get his advice. He'd been in that job much longer than I, but also to underline the delicacy of the question. And I was surprised, and Flora was furious, uh, that in question period after that briefing, uh, he and his uh, foreign policy spokes in the late Alan McEachan kept asking questions that were not direct, uh, but uh, drew attention to the, uh, uh, to the situation in Tehran at a time when it was still uh, evolving. Uh, Flora thought that was uh, worse than unparliamentary. She was very concerned uh, by that. Um, otherwise, uh, we both trusted uh, the judgment of our officials uh, and uh, did our best to uh, uh, move quickly, to encourage them to move quickly, because while we were the prime minister and the minister, uh, they were doing the tough work on the ground, which they did. Just parenthetically, do you have any idea why Pierre Trudeau would have done that and risked the, the, the whole operation to protect these hostages? I have no idea. And what startled me was that I found it out of character. He and I had lots of disagreements, but I was very surprised uh, that he would do that. And surprised, in fact, that McEachan would, because uh, McEachan was uh, a fierce parliamentarian, but he also understand the understood the rules of the place so it's it is um, it's a mystery that um, uh, and a troublesome one in retrospect it's it's hard to remember now or hard to uh, credit but in fact there is mutual respect about certain things across the parliament there are things you do other things you don't do and um, uh, putting questions that could put Canadians and Canadian officials at risk uh, was quite surprising Okay, Jeff, let's talk about the boat people. This was a, a, an absolutely chaotic situation as people were fleeing from their li- for their lives from Southeast Asia. Could you please uh, indicate to us what Flora's role as foreign minister was in trying to rescue people fleeing for their lives? Well, Flora felt that, uh, that uh, Canada had an obligation to, uh, to help uh, the situation. Uh, she'd always regarded her, shot, her Scottish forebears who, uh, who came to Cape Breton uh, after the after the Highland clearances to have been, uh, as she says, the original boat people, but uh, she uh, saw these uh, these these uh, the situation. Uh, she felt that Canada had to help, uh, and uh, she uh, proposed that they take in a large number of these people, and uh, and was supported at that time by uh, Ron Atke, who was the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. So between the two of them, they came up. Uh, uh, with uh, a plan, I think originally for 50,000 uh, refugees to be settled in Canada, and numbers increased from there. And I think the most interesting thing was that they devised this program, um, and uh, the Clark government devised this, devised this program of uh, basically uh, 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 getting the Canadian people to participate in the scheme, and Canadians who would take uh, who would take in uh, these uh, refugees and, and encourage that. So they brought them into the country and were settled with the. Uh, with Canadians and, and various parts of the country, and uh, and were integrated very successfully on the whole uh, in in the country. And uh, there's a group of Vietnamese organizations now which are still uh, Im- immensely grateful to uh, uh, to Flora and to Joe Clark for the uh, the work that they did in bringing uh, bringing these people into the country and, and getting them settled. Save, they saved their lives of, uh, of many thousands of people in the process. Yeah, Mr. Clark, I want to get a better sense of of how cabinet reacted. Because, of course, before you took over in 1979, the Liberals had talked about bringing maybe a few thousand uh, to Canada. And then Flora MacDonald comes to Cabinet as Foreign Minister and says, no, actually, we want to save 50,000 people. How did Cabinet take that? Well, just a slight correction of history, and and I don't want to be one to take any pressure off the Liberals. 
but the fact is that the private sponsorship program came as a result of a, an intense parliamentary discussion, uh, all parties, uh, but int introduced by the late Bob Andros, who was the Liberal Minister of, of Immigration. And uh, he was followed by Bud Cullen. And one of the things, one of the first things Cullen did after that election was go to Ron Atkey and, and say, look, here is what's going on and we can do better. And uh, Ron and Flora uh, were the principal drivers on all that. I have to say that the, uh, the other, the, in many cases, the unsung heroes on the Canadian side in that were members of the Canadian Public Service. Uh, starting with the Deputy Minister, the late Jack Mannion, I remember as Ron was coming to brief the cabinet. The late Jack Mannion showed him the page proofs of Irving Abella's book, None is Too Many, about mm -hmm. Canada's shameful performance in not uh, accepting Jews during the uh, under siege from Nazi Germany. And uh, he uh, posed to Ron the question, uh, do, what do you want to be remembered for, remembered for in, in history? Ron brought that to cabinet. It was, uh, it was um, uh, impressive. It had its effect. Uh, I'm sure there were there was there were some reservations in in cabinet about that in cabinet and in the caucus about that. Uh, I was surprised, I have to say, and I should have known better, uh, at our peak in that period of uh, bringing refugees from Indochina. We never had more than than 49 percent support of Canadian public opinion. Uh, that isn't to say the 51 were opposed, but they were not supporters. Uh, they had reservations. So this was a a classic case of of government-wide leadership really driven by uh, by Ron and by uh, Flora and by uh, some senior officials. It was a, a classic case of um, uh, all-out cooperation between uh, elected officials and uh, public servants. How often does that happen? Well, too, uh, too rarely. Uh, quite a bit, in fact. Uh, not always in the flash of publicity. And I think one of the factors was uh, that um, immigration officials who were dealing with people stranded at sea uh, did not have to follow, uh, were not, no one knew exactly what they were doing. So they weren't bound uh, by some precise reading of the rules. Uh, they were told, and they did, uh, that they had to act on their own best judgment. And uh, they did that, and some of them heroically. And uh, it, um, uh, and it, it, it's, a great, it's a great credit and a great model for the way uh, political leaders and public services uh, should work together. It was also, though, Steve, another time. It was when uh, uh, your medium, uh, for example, when uh, the nature of, of television and journalism generally uh, allowed more latitude uh, for both initiatives to be taken and, if I may so, mistakes to be made uh, in, uh, in public life. And that had bad consequences sometimes, but it had great consequences in terms of the board people. Jeff, I'm going to do a little fast forwarding here to make sure we get the whole story told in the time that we have. Uh, of course, 1980, there's another election. Pierre Trudeau comes back in, majority government. But then Brian Mulroney comes in in 1984, wins a very large majority, and biggest ever, actually. And uh, Flora is employment and immigration minister. Uh, doesn't have, you tell us, quite as good a relationship with Brian Mulroney as she did with Joe Clark. But then the big shock, 1988, the free trade election, she runs and loses her own seat. How did she take that defeat? Uh, badly. Um, she, uh, well, very, very upset. Couldn't, uh, couldn't understand what had happened. Uh, she had won pretty easily in previous elections. And uh, uh, she uh, thought that uh, it wasn't... Uh, uh, it, it, the, the, the Maloney government at that time, they had the huge majority in the in the, uh, the first time around in, uh, in 1984. Uh, and then uh, 1988 was the free trade election. And there was a, uh, the general consensus was the free trade had, uh, had done in uh, a number of cabinet ministers, including Flora and Ray Titian in uh, Saskatoon and, and some others. Um, Flora's own assessment was it wasn't just that. It was also uh, problems of negotiations with the, with the uh, public sector, the federal uh, employee unions of various sorts. Because there were a lot of uh, employees in Kingston working uh, in one way or another for the federal government, uh, employees at the prisons, uh, uh, universities, uh, colleges. Uh, uh, she said some some thousands of people there who were uh, within the broad scope of uh, 
of uh, civil servants and who were very annoyed at the government and the, and, uh, the Treasury Board because the wage negotiations had gone on and had not been settled. And uh, she felt that that was more of an issue in her case than free trade. And also she said she'd been there for, what, uh, uh, 16, I guess, 16 years mm-hmm. at that uh, at that point, and uh, uh, people were get, getting tired of her. And she thought that, and she said maybe it was the time. And she said, in retrospect, it's probably the best thing that could have happened because it opened new doors later for a totally different life. Hmm. And that she used to have her best years. Interesting. Well, um, as I read the book, I did wonder whether or not you were going to get to the issue that I suspect a lot of people thought about, but, you know, never dared ask her. And that was, well, she admitted to you, quote, married bliss is not for me. She liked traveling with men, but only if she could send them home to their wives after she was done traveling with them. Never married, no kids. You guys talked about it. What did she say? Well, uh, she uh, she said no, she's not gay. And it always been suggest- suggested that she had been because she had not married. And it's always that suspicious of, suspicion of people that are confirmed bachelors or or are confirmed uh, women who don't uh, who don't choose to marry. Um, she said no, she uh, she always liked men. She liked the company of men probably better than the company of, of women. Um, and she, uh, but she said uh, she uh, her preference in men was was married men uh, because uh, there was no risk that they would uh, uh, get involved in her life, and she could send them home when they're finished. She said, "I I like traveling with men. I cannot Im- imagine ever having to live with one." <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clark, you knew her for half a century. Did you ever ask her why she never married? No, but I can fully understand it. I mean. Uh... We're in an age now where there is more latitude uh, to women, much more latitude than there was. Uh, the spousal role is can be very confining, and uh, Flora knew that. But also, she was a very independent person. She uh, went off on her own from her her, uh, her very beginnings. Uh, uh, she did things that interested her. She took steps that she thought would make it easier for her to follow her interests, uh, not uh, more difficult. And uh, I. Jeff, in fact, has had longer conversations with her on this uh, this subject, but uh, uh, I was not surprised uh, by that. I thought that uh, she was looking for a way to be as effective as she could be uh, on her own, and she thought that being on her own uh, might add to that. Well, Jeff, I'll ask you to follow up on that, because she went to a lot of places in this world that a single older woman probably shouldn't go. Uh, We talked about Afghanistan in the introduction, but there was also Somalia and Rwanda during civil wars in the 90s, and Soweto in South Africa. And she volunteered for the Kingston prison system and brought a prisoner home to her home for dinner and found herself with a knife at her throat. What do you think accounted for this, you know, seeming need to, to have these brushes with danger all the time? Part of her character, she is a... Uh, can be could be quite reckless at times. Uh, she sort of pushed the envelope. Uh, try to do as what you can do, uh, do do more than other people can do. And uh, yeah, I mean, certainly in the case of the Kingston, uh, the prison for women, which she did succeed in getting closed uh, eventually. Um, she was trying to help uh, those uh, those inmates, and uh, the, the woman pulled a knife on her. Uh, and Fleur says she was terrified. And all she can say was to the woman, "You're not uh, you're not going to you're not going to kill me, are you?" And the woman. Sort of turned away and said, "No, I did not." But she had another woman she'd taken out uh, for a weekend, and uh, and the woman wanted to ride horses. And Flora had never ridden a horse, didn't know what to do. And she's out riding a horse with this woman, and the woman just took off and disappeared in her horse. And uh, and Flora was left saying, "Oh my God, I've I've lost this prisoner. <laughs> what am I going to do now?" And she's eventually the woman rode back and sort of laughed at her. But uh, uh, you know, uh, she uh, she did these things. But uh, she can't ride a horse, but you'll take a, a you know, a convicted a woman who I think had been convicted of murder, uh, a, a horse ride uh, with nobody else there to protect you. Uh, it's pushing. It is pushing the envelope a bit. Uh, but uh, she she liked to take chances, and uh, she, and she did on a number of occasions. Mr. Clark, when you heard about this stuff, did you ever go to her and say, Flora, what damn fool thing are you doing now? <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Uh, we've got to remember that uh, we would not be having this conversation that Flora McDonald not pushed envelopes. Uh, and it's uh, it's still difficult, but it was almost rare then. Not rare. There were some other women in her fields who did that. But we under, underestimate, I think, in retrospect, how confining the traditional roles for women 
uh, were even in that relatively recent time. And uh, Flora was uh, certainly on the cutting edge of that, but she was also part of a time when more women more successfully were uh, asserting their, uh, their independence. And uh, yes, I absolutely agree with Jeff that there was a, a recklessness to her. I, um, it was more evident uh, in her later life, I think, than it was in her uh, earlier life. Now, that may have been because in her later life, she was in more dangerous and more uncertain places, and she was more on her own. Uh, but um, I think that the, the bottom line here is we would not be having this conversation if Flora McDonald were uh, bound by sort of conventional thinking and conventional constraints. In which case, Jeff, just finally, what did the world lose when Flora McDonald died? Well, I think they lost a, a role model um, of uh, what a woman uh, who believes and knows in her heart that women are every bit as good as men, what they can accomplish if they try and if they're given the opportunity to do it. And that was her life was, uh, you know, smashing through glass ceilings when necessary, but just uh, uh, constantly uh, trying to make the point that uh, that uh, women can do things, uh, everything that men can do. And I think that uh, I think that uh, she did open paths uh, for women, both in par Parliament and in uh, other walks of life as, as a result of that. And uh, we, so we lost that, that example. But uh, I think it led on to other things, including the, the Me Too movement and the, the uh, acceptance of that movement now and and the, and the uh, women's uh, are, are much are much more as mr clark said much it's, it's time has changed and uh, women can now do things that, uh, that it was never dreamed of possible possibly doing at the time that flora was starting out and uh, so she's i think to a fair degree not only responsible for change but also responsible for a change in the public's perception of the role of women in canada well, we are happy to remind people the book is called Flora, A Woman in a Man's World, and we're delighted that it has brought author Jeffrey Stevens and the former Prime Minister of Canada, Joe Clark, to our airwaves tonight. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this look back at an extraordinary woman. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, December 20th, 2021. If they were founded in 1970, why is the renowned quintet, the Canadian Brass, celebrating their 50th anniversary this year? We'll find out tomorrow. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.